it's my very great pleasure to be with you this uh, well as most of you know i'm speaking to you from near chicago and the local time here is a little bit after 11 o'clock in the morning so it feels like i should say good morning to you but in your time zone of course the correct thing is to say good evening um i had thought to begin with um a, a three sentence prepared speech. This is sort of what I had written up. I do not speak Hebrew, but I do know how to use a dictionary and a grammar book and Google Translate. I thank you for the invitation to speak at this evening's event, and I hope that one day soon the state of the world will allow me to come join you in person. Thank you again. As do we. So I had, I prepared this hoping to uh, recite this in Hebrew. Oh, wow. This is what I had come up with, Erev Tov. I'm not going to embarrass myself because I can't do it without laughing. And I'll explain <laughs> why. So I hope there aren't too many mistakes. But during the preparation, during the preparation, um, as you know, you know, I try to go back and forth and make sure that what I say in one language matches what my intent is in the other. And along the way, at one point, I was using Google Translate. And it gave me, well, I'll let you judge what nonsense this is. It's making up words. I don't know what ishkobs are, steplastic, and I have no idea why serial is involved. I don't know why there's a question mark in the middle of the sentence. I don't know why the English is right justified, but this is my candidate for the worst translation ever. So I thought I would share that with you. And now you understand why I can't speak this without laughing. Just, I can't do it. The, the Hebrew actually looks great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. The left side, you know. Well, that's very kind of you. I'm, I'm glad I didn't embarrass myself too bad. So a little bit about today's program, and then we'll get underway. Uh, part one is an expanded version of the talk I gave at CPPCon last year. Uh, it's about 15 or maybe 20% longer, so it'll be a bit over an hour. And as you heard, this is the title. Then we'll take a very short break, and I would like to provide a brief tribute to someone I consider incredibly influential, yet I bet hardly any of us have heard of this contributor. And here's the title of that shorter talk. And then in whatever time there is remaining, uh, uh, and ask me anything. And, you know, please uh, come up with your questions, um, you know, write them down or uh, put them in the chats or whatever. Uh, someone will moderate at that point. And you're free to ask me about the talks or about C++ or about programming or what it was like 60 years ago. It's entirely up to you. With that, let me get this underway with part one, correctly calculating min, max, and more, what can go wrong. Okay. So what's the big picture? What is it we're gonna talk about first? Well, the Center Library, as I'm sure we all know long ago, much more than a quarter century ago, chose operator less than to be its ordering primitive. And it even spells it in several different ways. So in this talk, I want first to illustrate why operator less than must be used with care, even in such seemingly simple algorithms as min and max. Then I want to discuss the use of operator less than in other order related algorithms and show just how easy it is to make mistakes when you use the primitive directly, no matter how you spell it. And along the way, I will present what I consider to be a straightforward technique that we can all use to help us avoid such mistakes. In the C++ community, Alexander Stepanov is very well known as the originator of the research project known as the STL, the Standard Temple Library, and he comments that one of the amazing things which we discover is that ordering is very important. Things which we could do with ordering cannot be effectively done just with equality. But 
ordering is tricky. And let me share with you this image that someone sent me very recently. As you can see, it's a, it's a short list of movie titles, but you will also notice that the descriptions do not match. The left column and the right column does not match. It took me a while to figure out what happened, but whatever the sort order was for the left column, the right column is absolutely reversed. And I see mistakes like this all the time. But let me start by sharing with you my early adventures with Min and Max. So one intuitive approach that some people would start with is to define some function like macros in the C style. And it would look more or less like this. Now, those of us in the C++ community prefer to use functions rather than macros. So of course we can repackage this. The only drawback being we now need one overload per type. If you want min and max on ints, here is what you need. But if you want the equivalent for longs or floats or doubles or standard strings or your type or my type, you need one overload for each of those types. So in C++, the way to get around that is to lift these functions and turn them into function templates. And they would look sort of like this in the C20 style. Now, those templates, which I've reproduced here for your convenience, do have a few issues. One is that the by value parameter passage is, in fact, potentially expensive. For example, if you have large string arguments. And when the arguments don't have the same type, it's unclear what the return type should be. And further, can we even always compare such arguments in a generic way? As a simple example, consider one signed and one unsigned argument. It's not exactly trivial to do that comparison properly. And I'll talk more about that later. And of course, our major concern always, always, always is, are the algorithms correct for all possible values? Well, to cure those issues, most of it is fairly straightforward. According to the standard library specification, we enforce consistent types by using a named type parameter rather than the newer auto. And we can avoid expensive copies by using call by reference. Reference to constant, but still reference, uh, call by reference. And then after we make those adjustments, what you have looks sort of like this. And of course, we would have analogous for max. Now, as an aside, I just wanted to recall that L value references to R values have some subtleties. If, for example, we had a call to min that looked like that, we can copy the result into our variable Z, and that's fine. We're copying a temporary but that's a fine thing to do. But if you want to take the result by reference, you're going to have an almost immediate issue because that reference is dangling. Because all along the way, we've been using temporaries, and at the conclusion of this statement, those temporaries are gone, and yet we still have a reference. So just something to keep in mind. All right, back to the main topic. So what's wrong with those min and max? even after I've made those adjustments. Well, the issue is that none of the code I've shown you so far is quite right. It's tempting, but it's not quite right. I'm going to stop talking for about 15 or 20 seconds and let you review the code I'm showing you here for the last time. And then let's discuss what there is wrong here. Maybe you're referring to the consistency problem if they're equal? There you go. Exactly right. Did you notice that each of these min and max return B when the values are equal? And just to highlight, this is what I, what I mean. And so here's the fundamental question. 
given these two algorithms, why should they ever give the same result? It just seems intuitive, does it not? That if one gives you an A, the other one should give you B. And yet the standard library does this. Somebody, I think on Stack Overflow, claim that it took Stepanov 15 years to get min and max right. I think that's an exaggeration. But I'll show you in a moment what he has to say about this. But let me be very specific. The claim is that these algorithms, in fact, mishandle the case that A and B are equal. Now, someone posted, I think, again, on Stack Overflow at CPPCon 2014, which was the first CPPCon, committee member Walter Brown mentioned that standard max returns the wrong value when both arguments have an equal value. And he ended with the fundamental question, why should it matter which value was returned? Now, I've heard over decades, many programmers who make similar observations. And the argument sort of goes like this, equal values are indistinguishable, so it shouldn't matter which one we return. So this is not a very interesting case and barely even worth discussing. However, for min and max and related algorithms, these opinions really are superficial and they're really not correct. So let me share with you exactly what Alex Stepanov has to say on the subject. Um, in case the audio is not clear, perhaps because of the accent or for other reasons, watch the left side of the screen where I have the, uh, uh, the subtitles. How stupid could one be? I mean, one spends decades working on all these orderings and writing mean in the most generic way, and then he writes max, and he screws it up. And the person is me. And you'll say, well, but nobody will even remember that. Oh, no, people will remember <laughs> for centuries, because that's the max in the standard library. So for as long as C++ my shame will be publicly visible. So the master admits he made a mistake. Now, some people have trouble seeing cases where it really matters. So let me share with you a really bare bones example. Obviously, in a real type, you would flesh this out with many more functions and operators, but this is sufficient to illustrate the issue. A type named student with two data members, one for a student name, one for the student identification, and a static data member I've named registrar, the sole use for which is to initialize the ID member in the constructor. And the final piece is an operator less than. And please notice, for the purposes of operator less than, the ID is not salient. Now, when you define the operator this way, it turns out that each student variable has a unique ID number, but even equal values are distinguishable. So it really can matter, depending on your application, a great deal, which one is returned by algorithms min and max. So how do we address this? Let me begin with a very brief mathematics perspective, where we have the notion of a sequence that is monotonically increasing. And in the computing world, we would say such a sequence is sorted, but we cannot make the converse statement. And the simple counterexample is to consider a sequence of identical values. We consider them sorted, but they're certainly not monotonically increasing. They're not increasing at all, let alone monotonically. So instead, what we must say is that a sequence is sorted if and only if it is non-decreasing. And that's what allows us to have equal items in a sorted sequence. Now, the C++ standard uh, takes exactly this viewpoint, and there's the citation if you care to look it up at some point. It says, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, a sequence is sorted, <coughs> excuse me, if for every iterator i and non-negative integer n, indirect i plus n, which is the same as i sub n, less than indirect i is false. In other words, not out of order. So here's what I consider to be the important insight here. 
if we're given two values, let's name them A and B, and we're given them in that order, then unless we can find a reason to do otherwise, Min should prefer to return A and Max should prefer to return B. And that way, Min and Max will never return the same item. When the values A and B are in order, Min should return A while Max should return B. And when the values A and B are out of order, then min should return B while max should return A. And we can state this even more succinctly, namely that we should always prefer algorithmic stability, especially when it costs us absolutely nothing to provide it. And just very briefly, let's recall what we mean by stability. We describe an algorithm as stable if it deals with items order in such a way <clears throat> excuse me, that it preserves the original order of items that are equal. So a stable algorithm ensures that for all pairs of equal items, A and B, A will precede B in the algorithm's output whenever A preceded B in the algorithm's input. So here's what I recommend. For min, I think the body should look approximately like this ask the question whether A and B are out of order. If so, return B, otherwise default to returning A. And this is what I consider to be the version of, is there a reason to do otherwise? If yes, return B, otherwise default to returning A. And yes, I realize some people prefer, would prefer to write this by asking the question, are they in order? And that's perfectly valid but this is my preference. Now, analogously for Max, we can ask the same question, but of course you reverse what you return. And here is how I would write out of order. Given two values here named X and Y, declare them as necessary, return the truth of the claim that Y is less than X. If that's true, they're out of order. If that's false, they're in order. And we can, of course, write the in order function to invert the result of out of order. And by the way, in my experience of these two, I find out of order to be the more useful. It usually, is the ans it usually answers the question, do I need to do something out of the ordinary? In order tends to be useful is to find out whether I can return early. Now that's interesting enough, but I have discovered that these ideas are broadly applicable because analogous logic applies elsewhere. And I'd like to give you a few examples now of what I consider analogous logic. Let me start with the clamp algorithm that was added to C++ in 17 given values low and high and another value v that we want to clamp so that it does not go outside that range, we ask the question, are low and v out of order? If so, I return low. Otherwise, if v and high are out of order, return high, otherwise v, which I interpret as we prefer to return the supplied value v and I need a reason to return either low or high. Now, I find this pretty straightforward when it's coded this way, but I want to show you what I found in somebody's blog within the last three weeks. And I'll give you a few seconds to look at this and see whether you believe this is correct. Let me draw your attention to that predicate. Finished. And that's wrong. Now you won't find that on the blog anywhere because it got corrected within a few hours. And I just happened upon it because it was a, I found the blog. But this kind of mistake commonly arises when comparisons are inconsistent. 
by which I mean one's a less than and one's a greater than. It's not an accident that if you look at the standard library, other than equality, you will hardly find any other comparisons than less than. There are a very few, but only a very few. Almost everywhere you will find less than. Let me show you another example, a merge algorithm. In this algorithm, we're given iterators B1, E1 to denote the first input sequence assumed to be sorted, B2 and E2, the second input sequence also assumed to be sorted. We have the variable two, which is the destination. In the loop, the first two predicates check the condition that one or other of the input sequences is now empty. If so, we're really finished, all that there's no more merging to do, just copy the opposite one and we're done. So the interesting work happens in the final else where we ask the question whether indirect B1 and indirect B2 are out of order. And again, the interpretation is we prefer to take from the first sequence and we're looking for a reason to take from the second. And this is what gives us stability. Another example, a simple algorithm that just sorts two values, A and B taken by reference. If they're out of order, we swap them. And of course, the post condition now is that they are in order. And I understand that you could recode that, to ask ahead of time, are they in order? And if so, do an early return, otherwise we swap them. But as before, my preference is to ask the question, are they out of order? And if so, do some work. Let's expand this. Let's sort three values, A, B, and C. And if some of this code is unfamiliar, uh, just realize this is written in the C++ 20 style, where if statements now have the ability to have an initialization before the predicate. So I interpret this as saying, if after sorting A and B, it happens that B and C are in order, I can do an early return, I'm done. Otherwise, I know that B and C are not in order, so I'll swap them, and if after swap swapping them, it happens that A and B are now in order, I can do an early return. Otherwise, I swap A and B and I'm done. Now, this is a fairly classical algorithm, but the presentation, I think, is not very traditional. This is bubble sort. Nonetheless, I think it reads very cleanly using these in-order predicates. I went looking to see how other people coded uh, a, a three value sort. And I found this on Stack Overflow. I, I was not able to quote it verbatim because it would not fit on the, on the page, but I've captured the logic. And so I would ask the question, is this correct? You'll notice there are six separate cases to consider corresponding to the six possible permutations of three values. And the code is written in an attempt to do an absolute minimum number of swaps under the assumption, I guess, that swaps are expensive. So is this correct? Well, yes and no. Just look at those two lines. If A is less than B, then if B is less than C, well, obviously everything's in order so we can return. And that's correct, but it's not really complete. Just consider the case that A and B and C are all equal, which this code does not properly capture. We could do an early return and we don't. So in the other five cases, there is work going on that doesn't need to be done. So this algorithm does more work than strictly necessary because operator less than is not a substitute to answer the question whether two values are in order. And obviously this algorithm is not stable for the same reason. It would have cost us absolutely nothing to rephrase the predicates to achieve stability and get slightly better performance in some cases. 
So let me summarize what I would consider the main takeaways so far. Namely, there are two. The first is that by itself, less than is not sufficient to decide whether the operands are in order. It's not the same thing. It is sufficient to use less than to decide whether the operands once reversed are out of order. But there's more to the story. There are many standard algorithms that spell operator less than in other ways. There is often an overload that has an extra parameter, usually named comp, such that the algorithm calls comp of x and y to decide ordering instead of saying x less than y. And let me show you one example. Here's an algorithm is sorted until it's not one of the more popular ones in the standard library, which is one of the reasons I picked it. But this version of the algorithm internally uses operator less than. But there's an overload that takes an extra argument and has an extra parameter named comp. And internally, it will call that comp instead of using less than. Let me say a word about the algorithm. The, the standard specifies that its behavior is as follows. It returns the last iterator i in the interval first through last, closed interval, for which the range first to i is sorted, and it does so in linear complexity. Sorry about that. I'm in other sure. words, the point is that i induces a pair of adjoining partitions, first to i and i to last, where the former is known to be sorted and to have maximal length. Now, let me restate this without appealing to i. And I believe this is better for algorithmic thinking, which is for people like us. We can treat the range up to first as a partition that we know is sorted and have the adjoining partition first to last, simply to say, we don't know anything about the order of that partition. And then we can iteratively advance first, so long as we know that indirect first is in sorted order with respect to its immediate predecessor. And if you phrase it that way, it becomes clear after a few moments thought that the sorted partition up to first will have maximal length so all we need to do is return first. And it turns out this holds for even empty or singleton ranges, the usual special cases. So let me show you my earliest implementation of, in, of um, is sorted until using operator less than. Now, before I get to the main point, I want to say a word about the loop. I've shown this to other people who didn't like the way I coded the loop here. What I intend to say is that on every iteration, the value of prev is first plus plus, which has a post increment. But I would have to write that in two places. And we should always prefer pre increment anyway. You need a reason to use post increment. They are not equivalent. They have equivalent side effects, but they do not have equivalent return values. In fact, one is an L value expression. The other one is an R value expression. So pre and post increment are not the same. And of course, the equivalent is true for pre versus post decrement. So I factored out the increment and I put it in the predicate. And I've heard that some people don't like that. It's not traditional, perhaps, but it works perfectly well. But let me get to the main point of showing you the algorithm. I wrote this, I think it's been over two decades ago. And over the years in my experimentation with various implementations, I have a private implementation of, of most of the standard library. I experiment with new techniques and new technologies. And I've returned to this any number of times. And I remember every single time I looked at this, I looked at that yellow predicate 
star first, less than star prev. And I had to reconstruct the logic. Am I asking whether they're in order or am I asking whether they're out of order? Every single time. And I finally got fed up with that. So nowadays, as I've already mentioned, I prefer and I recommend to use what I've termed a named order predicate. And here's one possible way of coding that. Ask the question, are they out of order? And the out of order function could be coded as a lambda if you are, um, well, the, the first thing I want to give a short tip, please notice this version of out of order passes the iterators to the, uh, to the out of order function because they're typically very cheap to copy rather than as I showed before where I would have passed star prev and star first, which are the dereferenced values. In the generic case, they may not even be copyable. So I do the indirection inside the out of order. Okay. Um, and for those of you who are uh, stuck with a code base that predates C++11 and you don't have lambdas, you can always resort to a macro. Now, again, here's what the standard has to say about the use of an explicit comparison. Declaration compare pop comp is used throughout as a parameter that denotes an ordering relation. It's a function, compare is a function object type whose call operation is true. If the first argument is less than the second and false otherwise, comp induces a strict weak ordering on the values. For all algorithms that take compare, there's a version that uses operator less than instead. I have the opinion that the names comp and compare are a little bit too general. They're not wrong, they're not terrible names. But I would have preferred if comp had been named, for example, less than or abbreviated LT or before or precedes is, is a good one. But when you're talking about order, it's not less than that we want to know. We want to know about ordering and precedes, for example, would capture that. Now, even when we have an explicit predicate for less than, I still recommend adapting it via an order predicate. Okay. So I might write it like this, and now I might name it iter out of order to indicate that what I'm passing are the iterators and the indirection happens in the inside the uh, order predicate. Precedes of star y comma star x. And I prefer the name iter out of order in cases like that. Uh, another variation could be, you could name it indirect out of order. The standard library uses both prefix, for example, iter as in iter swap is in the standard library. In other places, the library uses the prefix indirect. Um, iter is a little shorter, so I tend to prefer that, but that's a possibility. Now there's another alternative. We could avoid overloading with a single template that has appropriate default arguments. And the declaration might look like that. I've not shown the body because it's the same, but notice I've provided default arguments, a default function argument and a default template argument. So I'm sure some people have at least two questions about this. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, what is standard ranges less? And question two, do we really need both default arguments, a default function argument as well as a default template argument? For a lot of people, it seems intuitive that one should suffice. So let me answer those two questions quickly. Standard range is less. It's just a class. It's not a template. It's a class. It's declared in the functional header. And it looks approximately like this. I've made a just a, a few minor simplifications for exposition. But I'd like you to notice that there is a member template, which is the apply operator, operator parents. 
And please note that this version does a heterogeneous comparison. It does not require that we're asking about two values of the same type. We can handle that, of course. It's the homogeneous case. But this version is for heterogeneous comparisons, so it's more general. A variable of this type is a function object because it's callable through that member template. There is the older standard less, which handles only the homogeneous case. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Most of the programmers I talk to nowadays seem to prefer the design of this standard range is less, as I've shown you above. Now, question two, do algorithms really need both kinds of default arguments? Well, let me show you the declaration a second time. And then I'd like you to consider a call. So here's the declaration. Let's assume we have an array suitably initialized and we now call is sorted until. So we have two template parameters that need to be deduced. The first is named forward, FWD. And we should be able to answer that question fairly quickly by looking at either argument. And so forward is inferred to be an int star, pointer to int. But what type will compare be? There is no argument in the call that we can use as a basis for type inference. So we appeal to the default template argument, which is standard ranges less in this case. The rule here is that type inference never applies to a default function argument. So the short version is yes, you need both defaults to make this work. What this means is that calling code can default construct the third argument, which is standard range is less in this case, a value of that type. Now, you may be asking the question, <laughs> why doesn't the standard library do this? And the short version of the answer is that it's prohibited, except for places where it's explicitly specified. And here's the quote. There's the citation in case you look it up. An implementation shall not declare with additional default arguments. So there's a prohibition on doing this in the standard except for places where it's explicitly specified. And the more recent things, the most recent algorithms in standard ranges do specify it this way. What was the perceived issue? It took me a long time, but I found this 25 year old paper. It says the difference between two overloaded functions and one function with a default argument can be observed when you take a pointer to function. And that's still correct. It's observable. And when the standard library was first specified, this was thought to be not a good thing. Okay. Also, consider a call that supplies a type, but not a value. If I call this function G and explicitly say the template argument is my type, but I haven't provided a value of that type, then we will attempt to default construct it, but what if my type isn't default constructible? There's an issue there. Okay, all right. So let's now change the topic very slightly and talk about standard disguises for operator less than. Because I went, when I went through the standard library, I found that we can spell less than in at least six more ways. So I put this table together and I will actually show you a seventh way in a few more pages. Let's go through these very briefly. There's class template less, which I've mentioned a little bit ago, which we've had ever since C++ 98. It was part of the original, um, research standard template library that Alex Stepanov provided. 
Then in C plus plus 14, we got the specialization less a void. And that's how we got heterogeneous comparisons. Notice the argument types are now T comma U, whereas for less, it was always T comma T. Standard ranges less, as I've already shown you, is heterogeneous. We got that in C plus plus 20. We got also in C plus plus 20, a function template named compare less. It's a funny spelling of compare. For some reason, we put it in the utility header. I don't really know why it went there, but it does heterogeneous comparisons for integer types. In C++11, we've got an overload set named is less, which does heterogeneous comparisons for arithmetic types, integers and float and mixed. And then in, C, in, in 2008, IEEE specified and C++20 adopt, well, incorporated by reference as part of the specification of the strong order algorithm that works on floating point types, but it's only homogeneous, two values of the same type. So let me show you very briefly how I would code standard ranges less. This is not how it is specified in the standard library, but I wish it were. So in the body, if both types are standard integer types, Defer this by calling compare less, which knows how to do integer comparisons. Otherwise, if both types are standard arithmetic types, then we'll call is less. And otherwise, we'll do, we'll use operator less than. My version of compare less. How do you compare two values of integer type? Well, if it turns out that both have the same sidedness, signedness, namely both are unsigned or both are signed types, then operator less than just does the right thing because it'll safely convert the value of lesser rank to a value of greater rank. Otherwise, we have to handle mixed signedness which is not entirely trivial. It's not particularly difficult, but most of the code I've looked at doesn't get it right. So this is now in the standard library. So if it's the left argument that is the sign type, which means the right argument is unsigned, then ask whether the left value is negative. If so, the answer is true. Otherwise, convert the left, treat it as an unsigned type. That's safe to do because you have enough bits. And then we do a less than. The alternative is that um, the right, op, uh, right uh, uh, um, argument is signed. The left is unsigned. We do the equivalent logic, but reversed. Another algorithm. Here's my version of standard is less. Given two values of arithmetic type, find a common floating point type. So if I have a, a float, I'm comparing to a double, the common floating point type is double. If I have an int and a double, the common type is n double and so forth. Then convert the values into that, into values of that common type, and then use operator less than. There's one small wrinkle, because whenever you have floating point involved, you always have the possibility of NANs, which are unordered. So if you happen to get a NAN here, although S, X less than Y will give you a correct answer, a false, you have the possibility of raising a floating exception. So in my code, I avoid that by ruling that out first. If X and Y are unordered, meaning either or both is a NAN, then just return false, because the left is not less than the right. Otherwise, we can do the less than comparison. 
I want to talk a minute about the ordering that is specified by the IEEE total order predicate. In general terms, it mandates that the order be from most negative to least negative and then least positive to most positive. In other words, first you have all the negative values in an order I'll mention in a moment, and then you'll have all the positive values, but in the opposite order. So within the negative values, first you have the quiet NANs and then the signaling NANs, and they're each ordered according to their payload bits. Oops, sorry, a little too far. Then you have negative infinity, then you have all the negative normalized and denormalized numbers in order by value, and finally negative zero. Then you have all the positive values in the opposite order. First comes the positive zero. Yes, zero is signed in floating point, right? Then you have all the positive denormals and normalized values in order by value. Then you have the positive infinity, positive signaling NANs, then quiet NANs. So that's what IEEE specifies. Now you may have wondered why does IEEE floating point layout have its parts in the order it does? Well, we all know that compared to traditional scientific notation, IEEE specification has decomposed, rebased, reordered, and adjusted the parts. So that for a 32-bit floating point value, you have components in this order. And the order is the same if you go up to a 64-bit floating point or even to a 128-bit floating point in IEEE format. But now just think about taking those bits and treating them as an int. If you compare them as ints, you can compare them in one comparison. So to achieve that, here's my version of IEEE total order. Uh, I want to note very quickly, the signature here corresponds only up to 2018 because there was a, the IEEE issued a clarification and now you're supposed to pass pointers rather than values to handle an obscure case. So this is not quite up to date, but this is now pretty straightforward. So let's handle the easy case first. Check the sign bit of the left and the sign bit of the right. And if, they're, if they have opposite signs, you know which one is less, right? If the left sign bit is on, it's negative. So less is true. If that's false, then less is false. Otherwise, I'm dealing with values that have the same signs. So now I'm going to use the new bitcast functionality in the standard library. So step one, find an integer type that's big enough. So a little bit of metaprogramming. Take the size of my floating point type and give me back the first of the following types that's big enough. And here I'm assuming, of course, strictly IEEE representations. Once I have that type, I'll do a bit cast of the two values left and right. And now I want to ask whether they're in order. And there are two cases because you have to handle negative values differently from positive values. Now, I promised you that there's one more, a seventh algorithm, lexicographical compare. And here's how you might write it. We're given two sequences, right? We're gonna iterate through them in parallel.
and it becomes very, very straightforward when you have the helpers for the out of order again. But there's more to comparing than doing the comparisons correctly. What do I mean by that? Even using standard compare less doesn't always give you what you want. So I'm going to show you a little bit of code, which I've adapted from code published by uh, Robert Secord, who has uh, very courteously allowed me to uh, mention it here. And the question for you <coughs> is to find the potential security risk. And I've given you a hint. So just look at this. Let's not, let's not give away any other hints. But as you can see, it's a function that's intended. You can tell it's an old function. It's written in a, in a C style. And it's intended to copy an array of characters of a given size. Okay. So I would ask in particular that you pay attention to this comparison. Now, the first thing that I would hope you would realize is that you really shouldn't write that with a less than. In case you missed it, it's because you have two different types involved. N was declared to be a size T, but K is an int. And that gives us a deeper issue. We need to consider the range of possible values of the int versus the range of possible values of the size t. And as, you know, especially if you intend this code to be portable, you have a couple different cases to consider. If the two types happen to have the same size, then the unsigned might contain a value greater than int max, And if you happen to have a machine which does quiet wraparound when you have a signed overflow, and that's a very common manifestation of what is undefined behavior, yes, undefined behavior, then once the int is incremented beyond its max, variable k will take on negative values starting with int min. And as soon as it does that, the memory locations referenced by p sub k where k is int min, precedes the memory referenced by p, and you're writing outside the bounds of the array. Oops, this is bad. If the two variables, uh, the two types have different sizes, for example, another case to consider, and n is in that range, then k will wrap just as before, we'll take on values in this particular range, which you then try to use as a subscript, and you'll be overwriting memory again. Oops. So even doing the, correct, the comparison correctly does not mean your algorithm is correct. We need to consider the ranges of the values involved. So my advice about comparisons Ask yourself whether you have a 100% no exceptions guarantee that the code will never be recompiled. Never be recompiled with any other compiler and or library or with any other version of your compiler or library or for any other hardware or software platform. And I suspect very few of us ever have such a guarantee then I respectfully, but nonetheless, strongly recommend that we improve our codes portability 
by avoiding mixed sidedness comparisons. As we've seen, they are risky. I can say it slightly more strongly, we should prefer same type comparisons. And while we're at it, we should prefer same type arithmetic for similar reasons. And the best thing to do is to plan to use same types even before we start to write our code. So taking my own advice in that function that I just showed you, I'm recommending same type comparisons. Without changing the interface, I've highlighted all the things that I've changed. The first one was changing null to null putter. But let me comment on the rest of the changes. Use a size t variable as my counter. Again, so I can have same type. Use same types even for constants. If this is unfamiliar, be aware that the z suffix is new for C20. Uz is the unsigned version of a size type value. Okay. And I even change the comparison because in a counted loop, y is less than the right thing to do. It does not give you the correct post condition, right? You leave a loop when the predicate is false. If you say less than, then what you know when you leave the loop is that it's greater than or equal to. That doesn't tell you that you've done exactly n iterations. But if you use not equal, as we always do with iterators, so why should this be different? Let me show you a particularly horrific case study of what can happen when you don't use the same types. And that's not an allegory. That happened. Here's the analysis. In 1996, an unmanned rocket exploded 40 seconds after liftoff. The rocket and cargo was valued at $500 million. And it turned out the cause of the failure was a 64-bit floating point number that was converted to a 16-bit signed integer. The number was larger than 32767, could not be stored in a 16-bit integer and the conversion failed, and the rocket blew up. Oops. Oops. OK. Well, I'm coming to the end of my talk, but I'd like to leave you with a bonus algorithm. I'll go through it rather quickly, but I think it's a very pretty little algorithm that a lot of people have not seen before. So let me start here. There are applications where you don't just need the min or just the max. Sometimes you need both of the extreme values. What we could do, we can get them by just reusing min and max. So we can write a little function template here that named min max that internally returns the pair consisting of the min and the max. And of course that works. But that's going to make two calls to operator less than one inside min, one inside max. Don't need two calls to get these answers. It's cheaper to make one call. And to achieve that, just ask whether A and B are out of order. If they're out of order, return the pair B comma A. Otherwise, by default, return the pair A comma B. Now let's generalize this a little bit. Suppose I have not just two values, but a sequence of values. And I'd like to know the extrema. Well, we have this algorithm in the algorithm header. It's named minmax element. Here's the declaration. And it's specified to give us a pair of iterators 
little and big M in the range first to last, such that M is the first iterator who, which denotes the smallest value. The first, you know, that's in case of ties. We want the first one. But big M is the last iterator denoting the largest value. So if n denotes the distance from first to last, we could use separate calls to min then max, and we would end up with an algorithm of the order 2n. Yes, I know two order n is, is technically correct, but this shows you where we got it, right? But 25 years ago, sorry, 30 years ago, Ira Pohl published an algorithm that needs only three halves n calls. So I'd like to look at that very briefly because it's very, very pretty. He not only published this algorithm, he published a proof that you can't do better. So here's the infrastructure. Given a pair of forward iterators, we're gonna use iterator versions of a precedes function an iterator version of out of order that calls precedes, iterator versions of min and max that each call out of order. And then if I let use the nomenclature little m big M to denote a standard pair of iterators that are in order, then let's assume that I have a pair up function that just takes two iterators and turns them into an appropriate mm pair and a meld function that takes two such mm pairs and combines them into one as specified here and then pulls algorithm becomes very straightforward given that infrastructure. I'm going to show you 11 lines of code, five of which do initialization, four of which do termination, and only one of which does substantial, substantial work. I know that only adds up to 10. The 11th one just says else. Okay, so with MM denoting a standard pair with an invariant that they're in order, Let's get things started. This handles the special cases of an empty sequence or a singleton sequence. All of that by way of initialization. Here's the rest of it. We'll call pair up to form the initial pair because now we know we have at least two, two values. So let's make the first pair. In the lavender code, we ask the question, by any chance, are we done? If so, we return. Otherwise, we move on to the next value and check to make sure that there's one after that, because we might have an odd number of values. If so, we make an mm pair of the, the last value and meld it with the value so far and return that. So all of that code so far handles special cases. So the nucleus of the algorithm is in the final line that says, take the two most recent values, pair them up, and then meld them with the best so far that becomes my new best so far, and then move on. And with that, I thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. That concludes min, max, and more.